The Catholic Church is a gathering of people who believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church and what it teaches through the Pope, bishops, and priests. The one holy, Catholic, and apostolic part refers to the four marks of the church. The church is one because it is all united under Christ. It is holy because Jesus Christ is present throughout the church. It is Catholic because it is universal, and it is apostolic because its leadership is descended from St. Peter and the Apostles. The Catholic Church accepts all seven sacraments. The Catholic Church with a lowercase c refers to the universal church, a church for everybody. The Catholic Church with a capital C refers to the Roman Catholic Church. The Bible starts with the creation story in which God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. Then, Adam and Eve sinned against God and had to live in a world with sin and death. God tells Abraham that a great people will come from his line. In Exodus, Moses frees the Israelites from Egypt, and he later receives the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. In 1 Samuel, David is anointed to become king, and God says the Messiah will come from his line. Then Jesus is born. When he grows up, he is baptized by John the Baptist. At the wedding in Cana, Jesus performs his first miracle, and his public ministry begins. Jesus faces temptation in the desert for 40 days, but he does not give in. When Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount, it is the foundation of Christian beliefs. At the Last Supper, Jesus creates the New Covenant, which says those who believe in him will receive salvation. He is crucified later, and then he is resurrected, and this is the basis of Christian faith. Jesus tells his disciples to spread the word of God. Finally, he ascends back into heaven. A martyr is someone who is killed for their faith. In the early days of the church, Christian martyrs were being killed by Romans or Jews. The first martyr was St. Stephen Martyr. He preached the gospel to the Jewish council and tried to convert them. He was stoned to death in 36 AD by Jews for supposedly committing blasphemy against God. Another important martyr is St. Perpetua. She was a Carthaginian woman who publicly showed her commitment to God. She was told many times to change her faith because she would face the consequences, but she still believed and was baptized. She was killed in the Carthaginian arena in front of the whole city. Tertullian, a Christian theologian, said that the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. The deaths of martyrs are important because they made the church publicly known in its early days. The Roman Empire was a pagan empire, and Christians were being persecuted. But this would all change soon. Before the Battle of Milvian Bridge, Constantine had a vision that said, Conquer by this, and it showed him a cross. Constantine converted and had his whole army convert to Christianity. This led to him defeating Maxentius in 312 at Milvian Bridge. He became the emperor of Western Rome and later ruled the whole empire. Constantine issued the Edict of Milan in 313. This gave religious freedom to all in the empire. Although the edict allowed all religions freedom of worship, it gave special favors to Christianity. The persecution of Christians came to an end in the empire. The work of evangelization became much easier, meaning that Christians could convert more non-believers, and the empire became seen as Christian. Rome fell in 476 due to multiple attacks from different barbarians. The Roman Emperor also went down with Rome. The church was the only standing institution left in Rome. So, with no one else to look to, the Pope emerged as a strong leader of Rome. The fall also left Romans wondering, why would a loving God let Rome fall? St. Augustine addressed this in his writing, The City of God. Augustine wrote about how their faith wasn't the cause of the raid, but rather how it protected him. He said that Rome wouldn't have survived at all without the faith and sanctuaries of the people. Today, the Church recognizes an ecumenical council as an assembly of bishops convoked and presided over by the Pope for the purpose of formulating decisions concerning Christian faith and discipline 
decisions which require papal confirmation. Church councils are called in times of disruption in the church. They address pressing issues facing the church and react to rising innovations and ideas. There have been 21 ecumenical councils so far. However, before these councils was the Council of Jerusalem. While this is not recognized as an ecumenical council, it is set as the model for all other church councils. It was called to settle an argument between Peter and Paul regarding Gentiles and Jewish law. The council decided that Gentiles did not need to follow Jewish laws such as circumcision, which made it easier for people exposed to Christianity to convert. The early ecumenical councils established who Jesus was and what teachings were canon, since this was still up for debate at the start of the church. This was true for councils such as the First Council of Nicaea, which decided that Jesus was both human and divine and that there was only one God. Later councils changed different parts of worship and further defined controversies, such as the Fourth Lateran Council, which allowed for Mass to be conducted in the language of the people. Monasticism is a spiritual and social movement in which men and women withdraw from the world to live solitary or communal lives to obtain personal holiness. The goal is to pursue God more perfectly. The first monk was St. Anthony of Egypt. These early monks helped the spread of Christianity because they showed the world what God is all about. Monasticism has been modeled after the teachings of St. Benedict in his book, The Rule of St. Benedict. He talks about how monks ought to live humble lives with vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And in the dark ages of the church, the monks were the shining lights. After the fall of Rome, much of Europe was in chaos and civil war. The peasants looked to the armed nobility for protection, and this created the social system of feudalism. Feudalism contained strict social classes, with nobility, clergy, and serfs. The church became involved in feudalism because it was a large landowner. This led to many church abuses, such as lay investiture, where secular leaders appoint people into church positions. Other notable church abuses are simony, in which people would pay for church positions, and nepotism, in which a church leader would give a position to a relative. This period of the late Middle Ages also included the age of Christendom, when the church and state were united, and church values were reflected into society. During this time, popes also had a large amount of power and political influence. Also during this time, scholasticism and universities were on the rise. Universities were able to produce theologians and canon lawyers. Canon lawyers defended the faith against attacks by reformists. The practice of scholasticism was an educational technique where different views on topics were analyzed and debated. Their goal was to synthesize on the knowledge of philosophy and theology to create one integral system of thought. The Eastern Schism was largely a theological struggle between the Western Church centered in Rome and the Eastern Church centered in Constantinople. The definitive break between East and West festered for centuries and had many causes. The divisions began when Diocletian declared two separate capitals and divided the empire. Cultural and theological differences developed over this time, which separated them even further. The fight over the acceptability of icons, the Photian controversy, which heated up over the inclusion of the filioque clause of the Nicene Creed, and unfortunate personality conflicts involving the Patriarch of Constantinople, Michael Serralius, and papal delegates led to mutual excommunications and the definitive split in 1054. Throughout the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries, the church launched a series of holy wars to attempt to take back the Holy Land, especially Jerusalem, from the Muslims. Pope Urban II enlisted fighters by promising them salvation and redemption for their sins. Ultimately, the Crusades failed in retaking the Holy Land. They resulted in massacres of Jews and Muslims by the Christians, and Christians often got slaughtered themselves in battle. One positive result from the Crusades was the opening of trade and information to the church, and these contributed to the end of feudalism. 
French King Philip IV established control over the papacy and moved it to Avignon, France. This was known as the Babylonian captivity of the church. The Pope had a large palace there, and it made him look weak. It made him seem like another corrupt political leader. Between 1309 and 1377, seven popes in a row were French. And during the Hundred Years' War, the Pope sided with the French, which weakened the relationship with the English. French cardinals were pressured by the mob to elect an Italian Pope, Urban VI. The French cardinals leave Rome, and however, they announce that they made a mistake with the Pope and elect a Frenchman, Clement VII. Both popes call each other illegitimate. The French and the Scottish supported Pope Clement VII, while the Germans backed the Roman Pope. Many Christians didn't know who the true Pope was. This gave rise to the conciliar movement, which said that church councils were more effective than papal rule. A council was called to discuss the conciliar movement and the schism, but it only made things worse since they elected a third pope, Alexander V, causing further confusion. At the Council of Constance, called by King Sigismund of Bohemia, the schism was resolved by electing Pope Martin V as the true pope. Many people started to notice the corruption in the church, such as John Wycliffe and John Huss. They noticed the church was shying away from the gospel values and decided there needed to be changes made. Innovations and ideas from the Renaissance, such as the printing press, helped these ideas spread across Europe, aided by the bubonic plague, which made people focus on religious matters more than secular matters. The Reformation truly started, however, with the reformer Martin Luther, who wrote the 95 Theses, a document containing 95 problems of the church. He was inspired to write this after noticing the church selling indulgences for money. Protestantism slowly arose after the people were exposed to these problems, which greatly concerned the church. A few other notable reformers are John Calvin, who came up with the idea of predestination and brought about Calvinism, and King Henry VIII, who broke off from the church after they wouldn't allow him to a divorce which brought about Anglicanism and the Church of England. The Catholic Church's response to the Protestant Reformation was the Catholic Reformation. New religious orders of Catholicism were founded, like the Theatins, who were based on the idea that raising the spiritual level of the clergy was key to reform, and the Jesuits, who do lots of missionary work to serve others. However, there were also negatives that emerged from this, most notably the Spanish Inquisition. King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella were intent on making Catholicism the religion of Spain. They used torture to exact confessions and to force conversions. During the Catholic Reformation, the Council of Trent was called to combat Protestant reforms. Papal supremacy was reaffirmed at this council, even though the Protestants did not show up. As further scientific advancements continued to occur, many people started to doubt Christianity as a whole. In the past, religion had always been the most trusted source for an explanation of why things were the way they were, but it started to be replaced by reason and science. During the Age of Enlightenment, the Church was forced to focus on more spiritual matters since it lost a lot of its authority and power due to science. Many other philosophies were created during this time, such as rationalism and liberalism, which continued to challenge the Church. The First Vatican Council was called to discuss these isms and other issues during the Age of Enlightenment. One outcome of this council was the declaration of papal infallibility, which means the Pope is preserved from error when teaching dogmatically or ex cathedra from the chair on matters of faith and morals. This led to the Church assuming a more spiritual position in the world. In the 15 and 1600s, Spanish and French missionaries preached the gospel to the Native American tribes in different areas. The first American martyr was the Franciscan missionary Father Juan de Padilla, who attempted to preach the word of God to the tribes in Kansas, and he was killed. Catholics were very rare in British colonies, and they were often attacked and persecuted. 
the colonies were almost entirely full of hostile Protestants. The Catholics generally fought for the revolutionists during the Revolutionary War, where they showed their patriotism. They also built many schools to educate based on their ideals. During the 19th century, there was a large debate in the church over Americanism, which was the belief that Catholics should adopt themselves to a best of American culture rather than seal themselves off as a defensive minority group. It was eventually decided that the church would not assimilate to American culture, though it would start to do so heavily in the 20th century. During the 1940s and 50s, the Catholic Church in America grew significantly. In the last 40 years, however, Catholicism has declined significantly in America. Catholic social teaching was brought about throughout the 20th century as a result of people suffering under the oppressive rule of communist, fascist, and excessively capitalist nations. In a remarkable series of forward-looking encyclicals, various popes have spelled out and defended human rights in all areas of life, including, in a special way, workers' rights. These encyclicals make up the official body of Catholic social teaching to this day. Here are some important things taught by different popes. Pope Leo XIII. He wrote Rerum Novarum, and this defended the right to private property and the rights of workers. It also condemned communism. Pope Pius XI, he condemned communism and Nazism, and said that justice and charity are the most important to Catholic social teaching. Pope John XXIII, he said that health care, education, and housing are necessary for all people. And he said that we have a responsibility to provide for the needy. Pope John Paul II, he advocated for social justice in the workplace. He said that economic development can free people from slavery, but it can also enslave them in a different way. He pointed out the flaws with a variety of government types, and he said that we have an obligation to human solidarity and to show others dignity. Over the course of these teachings from popes, two aspects of Catholic social teaching have emerged. The first is social service, which is giving direct aid to someone. It can be one of the corporal acts of mercy. The second is social action. This involves correcting the structure that causes the injustice. One must look at the problems facing the community and become involved in solving the problem. There are four main aspects of social justice. The first is solidarity. The second is education. The third is community organization. And the fourth is advocacy. From the civil rights movement to anti-war protests, the sexual revolution and the challenging of traditional gender roles, and the rapid advance of worldwide pop culture and information technology, the 1960s were a time of radical change around the world. At the same time, the Catholic Church was undergoing its largest reform in 400 years. Over the course of the decade, the Mass went from Latin to English, lay people were distributing communion, meat was being eaten on Fridays, religious were no longer wearing habits, Catholics were collaborating with Protestants, and more than a few peculiar scenes began to spring up. During the 20th century, the 21st Church Council was called the Second Vatican Council as a response to modernism. While Pope John XXIII started it, Pope Paul VI finished it because Pope Paul XXIII died of stomach cancer. The council met four times, and the main outcome of this council was a yearnomento, which was a willingness to embrace a new modern society. However, many people simply ignored this council, especially with the controversy of the church's response to abortion. While the church has overcome many obstacles throughout its existence, the church still faces many challenges today. Ecumenism, immigrants, gospel witness, and the vocation crisis are just a few. It is important to study the history of the Catholic Church so we can learn how to avoid corruption and keep the church for the same purpose it was designed for, a group of people who love and worship God.